It's my pleasure to uh, welcome everyone back. I hope you had a good lunch. And uh, we're going to now launch into session two of today's workshop. Uh, my name is uh, Sam Rani. I'm the Associate Director for Science in the Office of Research and Standards uh, and the Chief Scientific Advisor for Topical Bioequivalence in FDA's Office of uh, Generic Drugs. So today's uh, session two focuses on the development of cutaneous pharmacokinetics or PK-based approaches. And we're going to discuss advances in the systematic development of these in vivo methodologies, the study designs, the controls, the validation procedures, and the equipment that are being used to measure and compare the in vivo cutaneous PK of drugs that are applied topically on the skin. So we're gonna focus on assessing the body of evidence currently available using DOFM or dermal open flow microperfusion, dermal microdialysis, DMD methodologies, that have been used with multiple drugs, multiple dosage forms, and to be able to discuss the general utility of these cutaneous PK methodologies to support a demonstration of BE. Now, a key goal of the session today is to solicit generic industry perspectives about the practical challenges that may otherwise discourage the adoption of these in vivo cutaneous PK BE uh, approaches. Um, and to discuss some strategies of how to address these challenges. Uh, for example, by improving the efficiency of study designs and data analysis, um, or by clarifying the context in which these methodologies might support a demonstration of BE. For example, we spent the first session today talking a little bit about Q3 similar products, some of the considerations and failure modes, and the types of evidence that can uh, you know, assess the, the risk of those failure modes. Um, and now, of course, the bioequivalent study design. So, uh, I will say that we've got a few talks. Uh, we'll have three talks and then we'll have a panel. And it's my pleasure to uh, introduce our first speaker of those three talks, uh, Dr. Benjamin Kuzma. Uh, he is a research scientist in global DMPK at Vertex Pharmaceuticals. And he'll be speaking with us about a microdialysis, a dermal microdialysis approach to assess cutaneous PK of topical dermatological drug products. And um, if you'd like to uh, uh, to share your screen, Ben, uh, we'll be uh, we'll be off. There we go with you. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you very much, Sam, for the the kind introduction. And uh, as Sam mentioned, I'll be talking today about microdialysis, uh, using microdialysis as an approach to assess uh, dermal pharmacokinetics of topical dermatological drug products. And today I'll be giving a presentation on behalf of Grazia Stagni, who unfortunately uh, could not be here today. And so before I jump into my talk, I have to give the standard disclaimer that the views and opinions um, do not represent those of the US FDA or my current employer, uh, Vertex Pharmaceuticals. And so the overview of my presentation today, um, I'll be going a little bit into the background on dermal microdialysis and the historical limitations that have really limited uh, putting this into practice and using this as a, a local bioavailability and potential bioequivalence tool. But before we jump into in vivo, I need to spend a little bit of time on the selection of the dermal microdialysis probe, as well as the considerations that one needs to have when looking at the suitability of the probe in vitro. And then finally, I'll jump into some cutaneous pharmacokinetic principles that we investigated using animal models. The first of which was looking at local bioavailability of metronidazole topical products, followed by the removal of formulations at specific dose durations and how that may impact the local bioavailability, and followed by the exploratory bioequivalent study in rabbits. And so to jump into the background of dermal microdialysis, the, the, the overall goal of this particular proposal, this, this particular project, was to really look at the suitability of dermal microdialysis as a technique to assess cutaneous bioavailability and bioequivalence. And if you're familiar with the literature, there's, there's many reports out there that have demonstrated or show the potential utility for dermal microdialysis for bioavailability and bioequivalence ass assessment. Um, but they've also pointed out several limitations that have kind of, as I mentioned before, held this technique back uh, just a little bit. And so some of the things that um, were unknown, uh, one being the probe stability. Is the probe stable? Are we detecting concentrations that are surrounding the probe, or is the concentration increasing or decreasing because the probe um, is fouling or there's the, the recovery of the compound has been compromised over the experimental duration? 
And of course, with cutaneous PK, there's high variability in the results as skin is heterogeneous. And so what can we do in order to reduce the amount of variability that may be contributed from the dermal microdialysis uh, setup or apparatus so that most of the variability is contributed just by the product or the skin itself? And dermal concentrations were also too low to quantify. So uh, dermal microdialysis and analytical capabilities such as LCMS or HPLC UV, um, as the um, analytical capabilities have gone from H HPLC UV now into this um, triple quad or tandem spectrometry methodology, this has really increased the capability of dermal microdialysis and those low concentrations that we typically see uh, within the dermis. And also the study durations were too brief for an adequate cutaneous pharmacokinetic comparison of the products, uh, only four to five hours. Um, and I'll show you um, hopefully over the course of this uh, experimental plan or experimental results, uh, why you need to characterize the PK a little bit longer than that. And of course, the extended immobilization of study participants, which I won't be talking about today, but the following presentation does a, a wonderful job of uh, explaining how they circumvented this uh, particular issue. And so here we identify some new strategies to overcome these uh, limitations that have been identified throughout the literature. And so dermal microdialysis, uh, you have a, uh, a pump that perfuses uh, isotonic solution through the microdialysis probe. And so what you can see here in this particular uh, schematic is that the perfusate will go through this microdialysis probe into these um, semi-impermeable arms. And then you have a membrane here, which has been magnified um, a little bit further. And so what you have as you apply the topical product indicated in this simple schematic in this yellow with the red circles, the red circles being the active pharmaceutical ingredient. And so as that permeates down into the skin, you have concentrations that are detected uh, in the microdialysis probe that go from a high concentration to a low concentration. And if we blow this image up a little bit further, you can see these, these molecules that are going into the membrane, again, by passive diffusion. And so... Uh, some of the challenges with microdialysis is, is that the recovery can be quite variable from probe to probe. And this can be because the, um, the pore sizes within the microdialysis membrane itself can be different. So again, this is illustrated in this, again, very simple schematic where you can see that these hole sizes or pore sizes can be different. And so that can um, affect the recovery of the, the compound, the recovery of the unbound active pharmaceutical ingredient. So after the, the concentration from, goes from high to low, it gets collected in this isotonic perfusate, then it ends up in this uh, HPLC vial for later further analysis. Um, and the sample concentration that's detected here is proportional to the interstitial fluid concentration. And so the way in which we selected the microdialysis probe was we looked at a series of commercially available microdialysis probes, as well as several probes that we had fabricated in-house. And we eventually went with the in-house fabricated probes simply because it gave us the autonomy to change uh, various characteristics of the microdialysis probe, one being the membrane um, polymer, the, the um, molecular weight cutoff, uh, which is very important when you're looking at the recovery of compound as the molecular weight cutoff. And this particular case was 50 kilodalton. As you increase that um, cutoff, then you'll be able to recover more compound, but then you can run into the potential issue where you collect larger molecules, which then allow you or require you to analyze uh, before ana analysis of the sample require you to filter the sample. And so this is really one of the, the drawbacks um, of increasing that molecular weight cutoff. And so by measuring the unbound concentration without any proteins, you're really able to just take the samples, you take them as is, inject them into the LCMS and you get your concentration time profile. Of course, it's a little bit more complex than that, but uh, simply put, that's that's how we had done this here. And here we had looked at uh, various window lengths, but based on the size of the, in this case, the animal or in, in the setting of the clinic, that really has to be optimized in order to have uh, optimal recovery. And so here you also have a, another simple schematic of a microdialysis probe where this very thin line is the stainless steel, stainless steel wire that goes through the probe to um, give it some structure. Whereas the brown um, kind of squares here are the polyamide arms, and these are impermeable. And so even if these are under the application site, as you can see indicated by this green um, boxed um, dashed here, even if they are underneath the application site, the only area that exchange occurs is right here where this is the microdialysis membrane indicated by this yellow, these yellow dashed lines. 
And so going forward with this probe that we had selected for in-house, we wanted to look at the suitability. And so what we wanted to look at um, was flow rate and membrane length. And so this is a simple schematic where you have the relative recovery on the, the y-axis and then the flow rate and membrane length as a, a, a function of the recovery. And so as you increase flow rate, you will um, decrease the recovery, but this also can increase your tempo or resolution. So if you have a quickly permeating um, API, that might be suitable and that might be desirable. Um, but in our case, the drugs take very long to permeate, so that's not really um, that um, important. But when you also look at membrane length, as you increase the membrane length, you'll also increase the recovery. And so we want a high recovery to have high concentrations, um, to have that good temporal uh, resolution. And so our optimized parameters were 0.5 microliters per minute and 1.7 centimeters for the membrane length. And so this gave us the optimized parameters in order to um, translate this into uh, an animal model. But before we did that, we needed to look at um, the recovery or the loss in vitro. And so in microdialysis, there's two kind of guiding principles where the first one is this recovery concept where the drug molecules are in blue here. And again, they go from high concentration to low concentration, and there's no drug that's in the perfusate. This is just an isotonic solution. And so when we did this in vitro with a, a beaker, well, you can see that on the x-axis is the bulk concentration or the theoretical bulk concentration. And on the y-axis, you have the dialysis concentration, so the concentration that is recovered. And you can see that's roughly 90%, which indicates to us that we have a pretty good uh, probe that's uh, recovering a, a large amount of the molecules that are in the in vitro system. So it's a very simple system, but it, does, it tells us that we're doing a good job of recovering the molecules. Now, the other principle is this principle of loss, where you have the drug that's in the perfusate indicated by these green ovals or green circles. And then the concentration, again, goes from high concentration to low concentration, and you can quantify what comes out in the dialysate. And so here, we're also showing that the loss of the molecule is also greater than 90%. And so what this tells us is that if you look at the recovery and the loss, there's really no nonspecific binding or any potential issues that we may um, may come up in in vivo settings. And so with a very simple system in vitro, we're, we're saying that the system that we've set up here, the probe that we've developed, the probe that we've utilized here is suitable for metronidazole. And just quickly, I'll touch upon why we decided to use metronidazole. It's a, a water, it's a, a very hydrophilic molecule compared to those that we use in topical drug delivery or typically is used in topical drug 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 delivery, excuse me. And also it's a uh, very low plasma protein bound. And so for microdialysis, if you have a high uh, unbound fraction, something that's water soluble, uh, you should be able to get high concentrations. And so moving into an animal model, what we wanted to do was look at the local bioavailability of metronidazole from topical drug products. And so what we had was on the left-hand side uh, in one study, the cream was applied we had a, cream, a generic cream on the right-hand side. We had a generic gel, and we applied it at 3, 10, 30 milligrams per centimeter squared. So 3 milligram would be here, 10 is here, and 30 is at the bottom. And so we wanted to know, is the general microdialysis probe sensitive to different local bioavailabilities from both product doses and escalating product doses? And so what we also had was a question of whether or how re reproducible the dermal pharmacokinetic profiles are. So we have two probes under each application site as opposed to just looking at one um, and assuming that would be the same for any sample that was um, taken underneath the, the skin. And so we also had lateral diffusion probes. And the real, uh, the main question here is, is there a potential for cross-contamination? So as you can see here in this 10 milligram per centimeter squared site, you have a probe that's one, two, and you have three and four away uh, centimeters away from that application edge. And so we really wanted to know uh, if you're designing a clinical study, how close can you put these application sites and be sure that you're detecting only the drug that's applied on top of the probe and that there's no formulation that's cross-talking between different application sites? And so we also had two redistribution probes indicated here, um, greater than five centimeters away from the application sites. And so what, this, what these probes were really um, doing was that as you apply the drug on top of the skin at these application sites, um, indicated by the yellow, the red, and the blue circles, is that drug product going all the way into the systemic circulation and then re then coming right back up and potentially confounding the PK profiles that you see? And so we also wanted to sample for 48 hours uh, to characterize the entire PK profile. And the subsequent question is, is the probe even stable for 48 hours? 
And we had also measured things like transepidermal water loss and probe depth to see how may, these may ultimately impact the dermal exposure. And so what we were able to see was that the, the probe was stable for the entire 48 hours. So we had also perfused a deuterated metronidazole throughout the entire experiment in each of the probes. And what we were able to see if we plot this uh, essentially loss as a function of time, we can see that this is relatively stable across the experimental duration. And so um, this gives us confidence that there's really no probe fouling. And what we really see is that if there is an increase in concentration or decrease in concentration, that's the result of the change in the local bioavailability surrounding that particular probe. And this is also particularly useful, as, as I mentioned before, the recoveries can be uh, slightly different between different probes. So one may be 65%, one may be 70 And so by using this internal standard uh, as a probe performance marker, this kind of eliminates the, the between probe variability that we would see. We also saw that there was no significant effect uh, on the covariates uh, of transepidermal water loss or probe depth. So you can see here on the left-hand side, the exposure, the AUC normalized by dose uh, versus transepidermal water loss. And so this was measured before we had applied the products just to ensure that there was no um, very large values of transepidermal water loss that may have impacted the exposure of the products. And so you can see that they're for approximately from three to eight um, within the same range for both products. And um, while there is looks to be a slight correlation between the exposure and the transepidermal water loss, there was no significant correlation. And so if you take a look on the right-hand side, uh, on the top right here, we see uh, an, an ultrasound image of the stratum corneum and then the probe that's measured here. And so these values were just plotted as a function, again, as a function of AUC versus, um, or excuse me, normalized by dose. And so what we can see is that, again, there is a slight correlation for cream, but there's really no significant correlation um, for the gel. There isn't much of a correlation uh, with probe depth versus the exposure. But we do see one um, probe that did have a very high exposure, um, and that was also much more superficial than the, the remaining probes here. And so what we were also able to see was that there is a linear dose response. So again, if we have exposure on the, the y-axis, we have dose on the x-axis. We can see at the three milligrams per centimeter squared dosing that there was no difference in the exposure. But then when we get to 10 milligrams and 30 milligrams per centimeter squared dosing, that there is a difference between both the cream and the gel exposures at both of those doses. And we can also see that this, there is a linear and proportional increase in the exposure as you increase the product dose. And what we were also able to see was that there was a negligible lateral diffusion. And so in this plot, what we have on the right-hand side is the average metronidazole concentration. Um, here we have the gel at the 10 milligrams per centimeter squared, as well as the lateral diffusion one, two, three, and four away from this gel site. And then the same thing on the other side where we have one, two, three, four away from this cream application site. And RD just represents the redistribution probe. And the percentage of samples that were above the lower limit of quantification are just the number inside the bar. And so if you'll notice, this, this y-axis is broken out. And so when you compare the gel exposure, the gel average metronidazole concentration versus these lateral diffusion probes, it's approximately 10 times higher, tenfold higher. Whereas for the cream, it was roughly 30 to 40-fold higher as compared to these lateral diffusion um, probes. And so uh, after a meta-analysis, we looked at the deuterated metronidazole, and there actually was an impurity that ended up being approximately 0.4 nanogram per ml, which actually kind of aligns with what you see in the lateral diffusion probes and the redistribution probes. So we, we really concluded here that there was negligible lateral diffusion. Unfortunately, what we did not see was the terminal phase. And so in doing so, we weren't really able to get a reliable estimate of Cmax. And the concentrations at approximately 24 hours for the gel continue to kind of level off, whereas for the cream, they actually begin to increase uh, after 24 hours. And so, um, and with this result, uh, what we wanted to look at next was if we apply the drug for a specific dose duration or a specific time and remove the formulation, how does that impact the local bioavailability? And so in this particular study, we had used the same metronidazole gel and metronidazole cream, and we decided to pick the 10 milligram per centimeter squared dosing. As I previously showed that this was uh, significantly different in the exposures between the two different products. And then we also had three different dose durations. So we had a six hour, as you can see here, 12 hour and 48 hour and 48 hours just leaving the drug on for the entire experimental duration. We also had two additional probes um, to basically deliver the drug and then recover the drug, which is retrodialysis and microdialysis. And so I'll go a little bit more in depth on these. 
uh, in just a little bit. And all other procedures were exactly the same as the previous study. And so what we were able to see with this particular data set was that we had an adequate characterization of the dermal pharmacokinetics. And so if you take a look here, the um, six hour uh, dose duration is in gray, the gray circles here, whereas the 12 and 48 hours in the orange and red uh, look to overlap one another. Whereas for the gel, you can see that for the six hours, 12 hours, and 48 hours, there's really no difference in the exposure. And so if we take a um, uh, 80 to 125 uh, conference interval, kind of like the bioequivalence assessment, if you take a look at the local bioavailabilities for 12 hours and 48 hours, you can see that for both CMAX and AUC, uh, these are different from one another. However, if you take a look at the six hours, this conference interval is quite wide, um, and which may be due to some of the variability that we see with the gel, um, but they're really not that different from one another. And so the conclusions or the, the takeaway from this particular study is that the drying time ultimately impacts the dermal bioavailability. So if you remove the drug product before the, the product is dry, in the case of the cream, you can see that you have a lower bioavailability. Whereas on the other side, if you remove the drug after it has finished drying, in the case of the gel, then you really don't have any um, effect on the dermal bioavailability. And so as I mentioned uh, a little bit ago, I was talking about these retrodialysis and microdialysis probes. And so we had determined that there was no lateral diffusion, that there was no systemic redistribution. And so we were able to essentially deliver the drug and watch the drug eliminate from these probes. And so why this is important is because if you look at a typical uh, dermal microdialysis or dermal open flow microperfusion concentration time profile, from these application sites where you apply a drug, what you see is the relative appearance and the relative disappearance of the drug. You don't really have any insight on whether this terminal phase is the terminal elimination phase or if it's actually the absorption phase. And so what we did was we delivered the drug for 10 hours, indicated by the black um, triangles here. And so we delivered the drug for 10 hours, and then we stopped the delivery of the retrodialysis, microdialysis procedure, and then we decided to recover the drug. So we only had an isotonic solution that was in the perfusate after 10 hours. And you can see that this um, elimination of drug is much faster compared to, or excuse me, the terminal phase is much faster than these topical application sites. And so these are the terminal phases at the topical dermatological drug sites. And you can see that there is a, um, a stark difference between that and this retrodialysis, microdialysis, terminal phase, or what we've also called uh, dermal infusion. And so what this is telling us is that there's flip-flop pharmacokinetics. And so as the, as the title of the slide suggests, um, you may have guessed that. But when you compare the topical application of drug versus the dermal delivery of drug, you can see that it's much faster. The elimination is much faster when you deliver it directly into the dermis. And so what this tells us is that these terminal phases are actually the absorption phases of the drug, the drug product for the cream and the gel respectively. And so this also tells us that the drug product is actually still permeating down, even if you've removed the drug. In this case, it was 12 hours. The drug is still permeating down from the stratum corneum, the viable epidermis, and getting into that dermis, even if you may have removed the drug. And so taking basically everything that we've learned in this um, animal model, the Yucatan mini pig, we decided to do an exploratory bioequivalent study. And so here we had um, a, a gel and a, a cream, both had a generic and a reference product, and they were each applied one time um, on the back of the rabbit. And we used that same product dose of 10 milligrams per centimeter squared. So we had saw that there was a, a difference in the bioavailability in the bioavailability in the pig, and we assume that would be the same thing in the rabbit. But we did have one probe to assess the redistribution as we previously had, just to make sure that the amount of drug that we were applying in the back of the rabbit was not confounding any concentration time profiles that we ended up seeing. So we had seven rabbits. Um, this study duration was, was much shorter, it's only half the time, 24 hours. Um, in this particular case, we had used a probe performance marker of acetaminophen, um, just to see if we could also use that as a, a probe performance marker as we had used the deuterated metronidazole um, in the previous studies. And so all these procedures were also identical to the mini pig studies to really reduce the amount of variability that we had. Um, and hopefully that most of the variability would be attributed to the, the drug products or the, the drug permeating into the skin. 
And so what we saw was that we had an adequate cutaneous PK characterization, where here we have the metronidazole concentration on the y-axis um, and time on the, on the x-axis. And you can see that the reference cream in, in red here, the test cream in orange, as well as the reference and test gels that are in blues, uh, essentially overlap one another. And so when we compare these in a classical bioequivalence um, 80 to 125 interval, if we're looking for, we're looking for the point estimate there, what we can see is that in terms of the, the, the test products, when we compare just the, the gel and the cream for the test products, we can see that these are indeed different from one another. That's also the case for the, the reference products. But when we do a classical bioequivalence assessment of a test versus reference for the cream or test versus reference for the gel, you can see that the point estimates are within the 80 to 125 interval. However, the confidence intervals do span the 80 to 125. And so uh, with this result, uh, while not really conclusive, um, what we wanted to look at was how many rabbits would we need in order to power this study. And again, this is not to say that you should be using rabbits um, as a surrogate for, for human or clinical use, um, but this is really just a, a meta-analysis to understand where we could uh, operate in terms of animals or, or subjects. And so if we do the same study design where we have um, both a cream and a gel and both of their test and reference products, or if we use um, the secondary study design, which is a cl classical uh, bioequivalence uh, assessment that, um, as you'll see later on, they have used where you have one product, so say the cream, and you have a, a test product and you have a reference product and you do a classical bioequivalence assessment. And so if we did a whether we had um, reference scaled or average bioequivalence, you can see that in the study design A, you need a much larger number of rabbits in order to um, reach that 80% power. Whereas in terms of the B, where you have a replicate per subject, you see that there's a much lower, num a lower number of, of subjects that are rabbits in this case that you would need. And so in summary, the dermal microdialysis study design and protocol that we've utilized here has really shown that the probe that we've developed uh, in-house and that also is commercially available um, is stable. And we're also able to differentiate between two different product types, so a cream versus a gel in this case, as well as increasing product doses. And, and we had also confidence that there was no lateral diffusion or systemic redistribution, um, which would confound these concentration time profiles and thus complicate the interpretation of a, a bioequivalence assessment. Some things that are really important when you design a bioequivalence or, or bioavailability study are the distance between application sites, the product dose duration, the product dose, as well as the sampling frequency so that you can have uh, adequate temporal resolution. And also, as I, I've demonstrated here, the retrodialysis microdialysis approach allowed for the identification of a flip-flop dermal PK. This has been um, kind of shown in the literature um, with blood concentration, but it hasn't really been shown um, as obvious here as in the dermis, as we've demonstrated here. And then using this exploratory bio, bioequivalent study, we've shown that the point estimates are within the 80 to 125, but we just would need more rabbits in order to, to power this study. And then of course, the animal models that we've utilized here uh, were particularly useful to address fundamental in vivo cutaneous PK principles. Um, and as I mentioned, these were all done in animal models in order to translate this into the clinic, uh, some of the challenges that we personally have, uh, maybe other groups did not have, was the, the major one was the issue of the probe sterilization for human use, um, as well as the having a study design that maximizes the comfort of the participants while also having this high quality data that we've generated here. And so some of the things you have to consider are the number of probes, the number of sites, the study duration, and then of course you can potentially use continuous versus intermittent sampling. And so with that, I'd like to thank Professor Stagney, Professor Senamar, uh, as well as the students who had helped out on the project while we were doing these studies, as well as the, our collaborators at the US FDA, Dr. Ramazan Ali, Dr. Ghosh, Dr. Rani, and Dr. Renatu. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kuzma. That was fantastic. Um, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Frank Sinner. He's the Vice President of Regulatory and Strategic Affairs uh, at UNEM Research in Austria. And he'll be speaking with us about continuous skin sampling methods for the assessment of cutaneous PK-based bioequivalence. Dr. Sinner. Thank you, Sam. Um, 
Thank you, Sam, for the nice introduction. And we will now change gear from preclinical to interclinical. And no. Oops, yeah. And what I will show you within the next 25 minutes is some highlights from our 10 years of work together with US FDA. So we had two collaborative grants, uh, which we successfully concluded and one ongoing. And we had 10 years of development. I will show you data from 10 clinical DOFM studies. So there will be only clinical data in my presentation. We used about 1,300 DOFM probes clinically in all these studies. And the idea was to optimize open for microperfusion for cutaneous bioequivalence and to generate the scientific body of evidence that DOFM can be used for PK-based bioequivalence. But before going into detail, I want to thank our team because this is only possible with a huge team. Yeah, I had the honor to work with a lot of people from our UNM Research Institute and all our clinical studies were conducted at the Medical University of Graz. And we had a very good cooperation with FDA with numerous people as well as different cooperation partners. And the UNM research team and the Medical University of Graz team performed all the clinical studies which we'll show you today. And we are also conducting DUFM studies for NCEs. My presentation will touch on how does DUFM work. And I think Ben did an extremely good job in showing us how microdialysis works. And DUFM is quite similar, so I will only highlight the differences. Um, then I will show you how we do our clinical studies to give you an insight about how you can reach reproducibility and accuracy of PK-based methods. And then I will show you how clinical studies could be set up. So in the verification of the suitability of your clinical study design, and then to do a pivotal bioequivalent study. And I will show you three different APIs. So from very hydrophilic to hydrophobic and from low protein bound to highly protein bound. Starting with how DUFM works. So it is about the same principle as microdialysis. The real difference comes into place here. So where Ben showed you the membrane, which the molecule has to diffuse into the perfusate, we have a stent-like structure with openings. So you can look through the exchange stent structure. So there's a direct contact between the interstitial fluid surrounding the probe and the perfusate. This needs also that we have a closed system. So we have a push-pull pump. So you have here a pump where you push your perfusate into the probe and you suck it out at the same speed, so not to lose any volume into the tissue. And this is how we normally perform our pivotal studies. So you have at least two sites where you apply your test and the reference with multiple probes per application site, and you compare one side to the other on the same side to reduce variability and therefore you can use a head-to-head -head comparison. How does the OFM probe look? So OFM probes are produced by Uranium Research. We have a 0.5 millimeter outer diameter of our probes, the 50 millimeter sampling mesh where you have the exchange with the interstitial fluid. Uh, it is also inserted by an insertion needle, same as microdialysis probes, the SCE certified in Europe. The perfusate which we use is a physiological cell line solution. We add 1% human serum albumin. So we believe it is essential not to deplete the interstitial fluid surrounding the probe on essential molecules like human serum albumin. And we have developed a CE um, certified pump, which can um, be used for three probes in parallel. And so in push-pull mode, so one portable pump for three DOFM probes inserted into the subject. 
And as they are variable, people can go to toilet, therefore allowing for long sample durations. This is how it looks like. So at the beginning, everything is standardized. So we mark where the OFM probes will be inverted with a needle. Um, the needle is inserted. Afterwards, the OFM probes is inserted via the needle, and then the needle is taken out. The, to minimize the trauma, before putting in the needle, we cool by an ice pack, but no anesthesia is used. And also after inversion, we um, cool for a certain amount of time to minimize the trauma also after in inversion of the probes. We use application templates, in this case for three application sites per thigh, to reproducibly apply the same amount and um, surface area. Application is done on both thighs by two trained personnel for the same time by rubbing it in um, uh, the same gentle um, rubbing procedure. At the end, every single OFM probe is verified and measured for probe depths. And we also look at stability of flow rates. So in the verification studies, all OFM samples were weighed to be sure about sampling performance. Coming to some aspects of reproducibility and accuracy of DOFM, as you can see here in different clinical studies, we use different amount of dose of products. In the case of a cycle, we used five milligrams per square centimeter and 15 milligrams per square centimeter. Um, the same was true for EMLA, where we used five and 50 milligrams per square centimeter. And for diclofenac, for Voltarine, where we used two and 50 milligrams per square centimeter. And we looked at the bioavailability, which we get using our DOFM probes. And you see clearly that by increasing the dose in each of these cases, we found a higher bioavailability for the higher dose, which shows that DOFM can reflect and reflect um, the dermal concentration, um, which is influenced by the dose which we apply onto it. The same is true if we look at the time point when we wipe off the dose. In this case, we had um, EMLA. Um, this is lidocaine concentration. And we took off the, the product after two and after four hours. And you can clearly see that you have a shift in Cmax for the two hours and the four hours removal time. So DOFM reflects the dermal bioavailability profile of these topical applied drugs. Now coming to uh, how a clinical bioequivalent study could look like. So it could be that we have three different clinical studies. One is a metric study where we do not apply any drug. We just sample dermal interstitial fluid for analytical method validation. And then we would have a pilot study where we look at the suitability of the clinical study design to accurately reflect dermal bioequivalence of the drug which you want to use in the pivotal study. So normally we have to look, do we get absorption and elimination phase? Did we choose the right application time? Did we choose the right concentration? Uh, the dosage is a concentration range of an analytical method viable for analyzing the DOFM sample from the clinical study. And we would also look at, are we still in the sensitivity range? So by using a higher dose, is this reflected by a higher skin bioequivalence and a lower dose by a lower skin bioavailability? So not to be in a saturated state where whatever I apply to the skin would result in the same bioavailability. 
And we also looked at the absence of the lateral crosstalk between application sites and at reabsorption from the systemic compartment. I think Ben really nicely highlighted these points also in his preclinical studies and concluded that there's no crosstalk between sites and no reabsorption from the systemic compartment. And if you can show by the pilot B study that the clinical study design is suitable to be used for a BE study, then you could go into the pivotal BE study, which really have that your reference drug and your test product, and you do a bioequivalence test for your test versus your reference. And while our FDA research project, we look at very much in very much detail into all of these potential issues. And this is not the final study design of a pivotal industrial study. So just to have this in mind. So we really looked at all the different possibilities to then have the scientific body of evidence to now choose what are the important points to be included into an industrial pivotal bioequivalent study. And I think we will have perhaps some questions also in the panel discussion afterwards, where we can be more efficient if we use this for um, generic applications. If we now go into the suitability, so I will now show you for the EMLA product, um, how we addressed it. So we developed a clinical design to look at an EMLA cream and to verify the D of M clinical study design, um, we did the pilot study. And what you can see here is the concentration of prilocaine and lidocaine, prilocaine in blue and lidocaine in green, and the time. And you can see that nicely we have a Cmax of around three and a half to four hours, and we have a nice absorption phase, so elimination phase. Um, so this really looks nice in terms of PK. Um, we then looked also, can we use different doses and is it reflected by different bioavailabilities? And that's what you see here. So we used a five, a 10 and a 50 milligrams per square centimeter dose. And you see that we find a higher concentration in AUC for the 50 milligram per square centimeter dose than followed by the 10 and by the five. And we also included a non-bioequivalent product, which is Aura Cakes. And if you look at it, which we applied at 10 milligram per square centimeter, and if you compare the 10 milligram of EMLA versus the 10 milligram of Aura Cakes, you definitely see that they have different um, bioavailability. So also the negative control is different from the EMLA product. So this was good. We then also looked at lateral diffusion and then skin reabsorption. So how did we do this? So as you see here, you have three application sites and the middle one was left untreated. And we sampled in this untreated site to look at lateral diffusion, but also a systemic reabsorption because you can't prevent systemic reabsorption if there would be systemic reabsorption. And we added uh, DO of M probes in the arm, so far away from the thigh, to only look at systemic reabsorption. And if you look at lidocaine and prilidocaine, um, we found like 4,556 um, as a AUC, as a geometric mean in the treated sites and only 15 in the non-treated sites at the thigh and about 6.7 in the arm. This is about 0.1, 0.2% of the treated sites. So the lateral diffusion and skin reabsorption is very low compared to the concentration of the treated sites. 
we even increase this worst case scenario by applying additional cream to the belly. So we treated a subject with 60 gram of amla. And even in this worst case scenario, we only found about 0.5% of the um, untreated, uh, the, uh, the skin redis redistribution compared to the treated application sites. So even in the worst case scenario, which would never be happening in a BE study, uh, we are around 0.5% of what you find in the treated site coming from redistribution. So we also concluded, as Ben showed, that lateral diffusion and skin reabsorption is negligible. So coming to three pivotal BE assessment, which we did. So the first we did was a cyclovir. That was the beginning, so that's a couple of years ago. So we uh, enrolled 20 healthy subjects. We used Zovarex as a reference and an Austrian product of the same strengths but different formulation as a test product. We sampled for one and a half days continuously just to show that it is possible. And we used 12 OFM probes per subject. So we had two times Zovirex per thigh, and we had the test product, the Austrian product, on one of these per thigh. So this triplet was on one thigh, and the same triplet was placed on the other thigh. And at this time, we calculated um, bio, bio, bio equivalence used on average bioequivalence. Afterwards, we changed to Sabe. These are the published results. So if we compare the test product, the Austrian product, to the Zovirex, we see that they are a little bit different, especially in the later phase. If we look at Zovirex versus itself, you see that these two curves really match it each other. You have low variability, and if you calculate by equivalence based on ARBA, the test product failed to show by equivalence, and Zovarex versus Zovarex shows by equivalence. Keeping in mind that we don't really have a CMAX here, so it is also we don't have a, a terminal phase for a cyclovir. So then we moved on to EMLA, as it is a, combination, a combinational product of lidocaine and prilidocaine. And we improved our setting to having the reference versus itself, but we included an FDA approved generic product to EMLA and a non-equivalent product. So we wanted to look if the product to itself is bioequivalent, if the approved generic is bioequivalent, to the, its reference, and if the non-bioequivalent product is non-bioequivalent to the reference. Again, we had 20 healthy subjects. Um, we dosed for three hours, then it was removed, and we sampled for 24 hours, and BE was calculated based on scaled average bioequivalence. Here are the results. So if we compare EMLA to itself, we see that these for prilocaine and for lidocaine, they're more or less overlapping. And if we calculate by equivalence based on current FDA guidelines using Saba, we can show that these, that EMLA is by equivalent to itself. If we look at the US FDA approved generic versus EMLA, again, these PK profiles are matching each other very nicely. And if we calculate by equivalence based on FDA guidelines, we also show that it is within the bioequivalence range. And if you look at the non-BE product versus EMLA, you can clearly see that this, this is not matching. So this is for prilocaine for the EMLA product and you have it here for the generic. Same is true for lidocaine. This is for the EMLA, and you have it 
down here for the non-BE product. And this is also reflected if you calculate by equivalence, so it fails to show by equivalence and the point estimator, et cetera, are not within the by equivalence range. We then moved on to have a look at, does it make a change if we apply a higher dose of EMLA? So in the clinical study, which I just showed you before, we used 15 milligram per square centimeters. In this clinical study, we used 150 milligrams per square centimeters. So we had a much higher, 10 times higher dose, which we applied um, to the subjects. Again, we, we had 20 healthy subjects. Um, dosing was for three hours. We only sampled for, 20, for 12 hours and we had 15 DOFM probes and also some microdialysis probes for comparison. And to, just to highlight the bioequivalence of EMLA to itself. So we looked at the two sites where we applied EMLA and we had the DOFM probes beneath and we were able to show bioequivalence for lidocaine and for prilidocaine based on AUC and CMAX. So even with 150 milligram per square centimeter, we were able to show bioequivalence of EMLA to itself. We then moved on to diclofenac. So we wanted to cover the entire range of lipophilicity and protein binding. So a cyclovir is very uh, hydrophilic and low protein bound. EMLA is moderately protein bound and moderately lipophilic in its APIs. And diclofenac is highly hydrophobic and highly protein bound API. Um, just to show that DOFM can assess all APIs um, as long as you can quantify it by your HPLC MSMS method. Um, here we had a design where we used a US approved generic versus its reference and a non bioequivalent diclofenac product. And we only had 16 healthy subjects due to budget restrictions at this time. Uh, we used Voltaren as our reference and 1% um, sodium gel from Perigo as a non bioequivalent product, uh, as a generic product, and Pensate as a negative control. Dosing was done for six hours and we had a 24 hours sampling duration. And just to highlight that even quite complicated clinical protocols are possible by DUFM, we had 27 DUFM probes per subject um, in parallel. And we sampled for 24 hours, all these 27 DUFM probes. Coming to some results. So what you see here that the non-bioequivalent product is completely different to our reference. So you see a very high concentration for the pensate. And we see that our reference and the generic are similar. We are still investigating the data, so we are not finished yet. But we see that the, the pensate is failing to show bioequivalence as it should and that we can show bioequivalence from the generic to the reference product in the female, in the male subgroup. And we are still working on the data for the female subgroup. So in total, I hope that I was able to show you that DUFM as well as microdialysis before is a very good PK-based methods um, to be used for bioequivalence. And up to now, the DUFM probes, which are patented by your name research, were only available um, by us. So your name research and the Maryland University of Graz uh, did all the DUFM studies together. So within this FDA project, but we also do it for sponsors. 
And to make this now more widely available, we have launched a call for partnership. So we are seeking two um, CROs or other organizations, which we would license all our knowledge, all the probes, um, pumps, would do um, the quality controls, etc., so that they are able to offer it to industry um, to be able to perform bioequivalence um, clinical studies efficiently and more efficiently and more cost effectiveness than we can do it right now. So if anyone is interested in partnering with us, please contact me and we are happy to discuss it with you. So in summary, I hope that I was able to show you that continuous sampling techniques like DUFM had advanced dramatically over the last decade, that they are able to measure the rate and extent to which these locally acting drugs become available. And I hope I was able to show you with our clinical data that um, DUFM is sensitive um, and accurate and reproducible to be also used as a PK-based BE approach. And I'm looking forward to the discussion afterwards in the panel session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Sinner. That was a fantastic talk and looking forward to the panel discussion as well. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Tanaz Ramazanli from the uh, FTA. Uh, she has been leading the research in this area and uh, will be speaking to us um, about cutaneous based, uh, cutaneous PK based techniques, uh, translating scientific advances to regulatory methods. Uh, Dr. Ramazanli is the senior pharmacologist in uh, the Division of Therapeutic Performance within the Office of Research and Standards. Uh, Dr. Ramazanli. Um, thank you very much for a nice introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, you heard from Dr. Um, Kuzma and Dr. Fang uh, on an overview of uh, these um, thermal sampling techniques, microdialysis and microperfusion, and how uh, these can be used uh, to compare bioavailability of topical drugs, and you saw several examples. Um, now, in this presentation, I would like to focus on how we can translate these scientific advances related to these techniques um, and to regulatory methodologies that can be used for bioequivalence assessment of topical products. Um, this presentation reflects my views and not the views of the agency. Um, so you heard from Dr. Rani's presentation that we have this paradigm for categorizing bioequivalence strategies for topical drug products, and it's based on uh, Q3 properties or arrangement of matter and their underlying matter, which is a component and composition of the formulation. Uh, so for example, you heard that if the, um, there are differences in the Q3 and different significant differences in the formulation between a test and reference product, then a test product is eligible for in vivo um, bioequivalence approaches that are recommended in our PSG, such as comparable, comparative clinical endpoint studies. And when we have a well-matched Q3 and well-matched formulation between a test and reference standard, then um, the test a product is eligible for characterization-based approaches. Um, but when the test product as um, acceptable Q3 properties, um, but has significant differences in the formulation compared to the reference standard. This is where we have been uh, trying to develop efficient bioequivalent standards and um, DOFM and DMD techniques um, uh, can be used for uh, assessing cutaneous PK um, and, and may have potential use for bioequivalence assessment of this category of drug products. Um, here, um, I'm showing what type of research that we have doing, been doing um, and what type of approaches we have been developing for those category of test products that have significant differences in the formulation compared to the innovator product or reference standard. Uh, one type of approach that you heard uh, about in session one was to uh, understand the impact of formulation differences on thermodynamic activity and sensorial properties of topical products. And the second approach is using um, cutaneous PK-based methods uh, uh, using 
dermal microdiosis and dermal microperfusion. And this is the um, focus of session two and session three of these workshops. We have done um, a decade of research on this in this area and we are in advanced stages of development. We are also looking into developing um, other types of cutaneous PK approaches, um, such as ones using a spectroscopy and imaging tools. Um, so uh, under Bedufa, we have funded a, uh, five research awards um, to evaluate applicability of these novel methodologies like uh, microperfusion and microdiosis to assess bioavailability and bioequivalence of topical products. Um, the awards uh, that were uh, given to UNIM Research in Austria uh, focused on uh, developing DOFM technology as a bioequivalence tool, and the awards given to Long Island University focused on um, evaluating microdialysis and understanding some fundamentals about cutaneous pharmacokinetics. And you heard uh, from Dr. Kuzma about uh, outcomes of this award in LIU and outcomes of these two awards. You heard about them from Dr. Sinner. Um, so this is an overview of all, um, most of the studies that we have done under these um, uh, research awards in, under Godufa. And uh, for most of them, you, you heard and saw the results of these studies in the last two presentations. And what I would like to uh, point out is that we, for example, started with a, a drug like acyclovir um, that is relatively low permeating, but it's hydrophilic and minimally protein bound. And uh, it took us a few um, small clinical studies to optimize the study design. And finally, we're able to conduct a successful BE study with that. Um, and then next we moved to uh, um, drugs uh, that were more lipophilic and have some protein binding like lidocaine, perlocaine, and um, the DOF, we used DOFM and um, we saw that promising results uh, for bioequivalence assessment of these products. And next we move to diclofenac sodium, uh, which uh, is more lipophilic and highly protein bind. And it historically was known to be very challenging to use it with this continuous sampling techniques, but we also were able to uh, compare bioavailability of um, diclofenac sodium uh, to, um, uh, from topical formulations. And with LIU, we used um, mitronidazole, which is hydrophilic and minimal protein bind. And we were able to use it with um, uh, like um, more lipophilic compounds such as lidocaine, perlocaine. Um, so in order to make sure these techniques have regulatory application, we needed to evaluate if they can be used for a variety of topical products or not. So um, historically, um, we it was assumed that maybe microdialysis can cannot be used for lipophilic drug molecules or may not be suitable for some classes of drug products. So we wanted to understand, can we use this methodology for lipophilic drugs as well? And can, uh, if we have two drug molecules in one formulation, and in case of, for example, lidocaine and perlocaine, we have two similarly structured drug molecules. Can we uh, measure and track both of them simultaneously using these techniques? And what would be the performance of one of these like DMD versus DOFM? Um, or another question um, that we wanted to answer was, um, how is the dermal disposition param uh, parameters, um, um, how, how, how these parameters are dependent on the dose that is applied? So if you remember the profiles that you saw from Dr. Sinners or Dr. Kuzma, uh, we would get a different shape of the profile sometimes with amount, applying different dose amounts. So we wanted to understand whether these dermal disposition parameters were dependent on the dose applied or not. So to answer to some of these questions, we um, develop um, this study design at LIU. And um, I, I won't go into the concepts of retrodiosis, microdiosis, because Dr. Kuzma nicely explained them. Uh, so just briefly in, in this study that was done in rabbits, um, we had uh, initially used a perfusate with drug concentration either lidocaine, perlocaine, or lidocaine and perlocaine. And um, it was perfused for a certain amount of time, certain hours. Um, and, um, this, and during that time, we were expected to, after getting to equilibrium, um, see a relatively constant uh, concentration in the dialysate samples. And then um, after uh, a certain amount of time, we switched the perfusate to a, a solution that doesn't have drug. Uh, and we measured the drug uh, concentration um, in the dialysis for the remaining time of the sampling. And uh, the idea is um, now that we stopped um, 
having drug input into the skin, uh, that as the drug gets cleared from the skin, we would expect it to detect lower and lower amount of drug in the dialysis sample. And you can see that uh, what we what we actually um, got from this result showing the same thing, um, and that we uh, we could capture the true dermal elimination um, phase for lidocaine and perlocaine and um, these drugs uh, when they um, were perfused together. Um, so another interesting observation was um, we used different uh, concentration of these drugs uh, in a wide range from 50, milligram per, uh, 50 microgram per ml up to 500 microgram per ml in the perfusate. And the concentration we detect in dialysis samples correlated nicely with the concentration in the perfusate. So as we increased the concentration in the perfusate, the concentration in the dialysate also, did also increase. And when we use this um, elimination phase to calculate the dermal disposition of both lidocaine and perlocaine, we understood that those parameters like half-life clearance or volume of distribution were independent of the dose that was um, delivered directly to the skin. Another interesting study that we did at UNM Research was um, comparing the performance of microperfusion to microdialysis in 20 subjects. And in this study, um, uh, the lidocaine perlocaine cream product was applied. And here shows the application site. And on one application site, we have three microdialysis probes. And on the other, we had three DOFM probes. Um, and here shows the concentration that was detected with um, DOFM in green and microdialysis in yellow for both lidocaine and perlocaine. Um, so one observation was the concentration detected in DMD probes were slightly higher than the DMD probes. And, and this is expected because um, uh, the nature of equilibrium in these probes are different. And as Dr. Kuzma mentioned, the, in DMD, we are measuring the free drug only. So, um, so this difference is, is expected. But interestingly, if you, if you compare the shape of the profile, the CMAX, or even the ratio of pilocaine to lidocaine uh, between these two um, sampling techniques, we, it, these are very consistent. So um, this data show that both of them are capable to be used to compare bioavailability of lidocaine and prelocaine products. Um, in the studies that we did to evaluate DOFM and DMD, we need to make sure we are using a design where we have adequate discrimination capability for the cutaneous bioavailability. And one way to test um, that was to use different dose amounts of drug um, uh, product to show that the bioavailability of the target dose is differentiated from the higher dose and making sure that our target dose for the BE study is not that high to cause, uh, to cause saturation uh, of the permeation pathways uh, so that we can no longer um, uh, detect a uh, decrease in the bioavailability. So in one of the studies with lidocaine perlocaine products, um, and we are showing the results for lidocaine, we used three different dose amounts of 10 um, as our target dose and 15 as our higher dose and five as our lower dose. And you see that by increasing the dose, we got increase in the concentration in the dermis and by decreasing the dose, we got decrease in the concentration. Um, however, um, the nature of the skin permeation is that um, the rate and extent of drug permeation is not proportional to the dose amounts or to the strength. So by increasing from 10 to 15 or by increasing 50% of the dose, you cannot expect to see 50% increase in the bioavailability. Um, so we need to carefully design these discrimination studies to, to make sure we can capture uh, this, um, this we can adequately um, capture this discrimination. So for the next study with Dr. Leofana, we actually selected a um, um, larger dose as our higher dose. Uh, here we have the 10 milligram as our target dose, and we compared the um, concentration profiles of this dose versus a lower dose and a higher dose, and you can see that these are nicely discriminated. Um, another way to... Um, evaluate discrimination capability of our design was to use an altered formulation of the uh, same drug. So for example, in this uh, study, we used uh, Voltaren gel, Daclofenac sodium gel product, and Daclofenac solution product at the same dose amounts. And the solution product gave us much higher bioavailability of uh, Daclofenac compared to the gel product. And this is another example with lidocaine perlocaine products where the cream product 
showed a higher bioavailability of both APIs compared to the gel products. Um, and while we, for example, here see very distinct um, differentiation between um, two different concentration profiles with the lidocaine, uh, perlocaine examples that I showed earlier, um, we, um, we see some um, overlapping in the standard errors um, between the 10, um, 10 milligram dose and the higher dose. And, and uh, the question was asked, uh, how can we assure these two um, concentrations of PKs, uh, cutaneous PK profiles are truly different and discriminated? Um, well, these are studies are done in um, limited number of subjects, um, up to six, and, uh, and we have some variability, and it's not appropriate to use um, our typical uh, BE statistical analysis um, to compare the profiles. So we needed to come up with appropriate quantitative methods to compare um, the, these PK profiles. And one of these methods that gave us a promising results was the F1 and F2. Um, this difference and similarity factor. Uh, so both of these factors uh, were calculated for percent concentration and percent AUC uh, for multiple uh, comparison scenarios where uh, the 10 milligram was our target strength and was compared with lower strength, higher strength, and uh, a different or altered formulation. And interestingly, um, the F1 and F2 analysis showed that while um, the, the C, uh, from CMAX standpoint, that this uh, 10 milligram and 50 milligram are differentiated from AUC standpoint, these two are not um, discriminated. Uh, we also coupled this with um, bootstrap analysis because we, as you see, we have the variability in the data. Uh, so we were able to generate um, confidence intervals for um, each of these comparison and uh, better evaluate um, the discrimination of these uh, PK profiles. Now let's talk about some considerations for the study designs, uh, especially when we are uh, conducting them to evaluate BE. So one of the important considerations of the study design is the product dose, what, what dose is appropriate for you to use in a BE study. And uh, as I showed, we, we have done some pilot studies to justify the dose and show that um, it's, the dose is not high and um, as a, and our design is, has adequate discrimination capability. But even if you want to conduct a pilot study, how do you know uh, which doses you can take or which uh, doses would give you discriminated PK profiles? Um, so for a, one of our studies, like with diclofenac top, sodium topical gel product, we actually did some in vitro and in silico evaluations to come up with appropriate dose for the pilot study. Um, here shows the drying rate profiles of, the, uh, of this um, diclofenac gel uh, at different dose amounts of from two milligram up to 50 milligram. And the thinking was as the product evaporates or undergoes metamorphosis, the drug concentration in the formulation may change and uh, its um, degree of saturation may change. And as a result, the thermodynamic activity of the drug may change and that can impact the rate and extent of drug permeation. Um, so, in this study, you can see that uh, with a two milligram dose, um, uh, we saw a very distinct difference in the drawing rate profile uh, between 10 and two, and also between 10 and um, 50 or 30 milligram. Uh, we also used um, modeling and simulation to predict the concentration profiles in the skin using uh, our uh, specific study design. And we predict this concentration for different dose amounts from 10 milligram up to 50 milligram. And the results we got uh, were in agreement with the result of drying rate studies where, for example, for 10 milligram and 50 milligram dose, um, if you consider the variability, uh, we don't see that much dis differentiation in the PK profile. Also, um, their drying profile was very similar but uh, we see a very nice uh, discrimination between the 10 milligram and the 15 milligram dose, uh, uh, as well as what we see with from 10 milligram drying profile and the 15 milligram drying profile. So we use um, two milligram, 10 milligram, 15 milligram in the pilot study, and we were able to nicely um, discriminate or establish discriminated PK profiles uh, using these three dose amounts. Another consideration for the study design is the study duration um, for how long you need to continue sampling and for how long you need to apply the product on the skin. And um, 
we learned that by modulating the duration of product application, we can change the Tmax or change the shape of the profile. And, and when, for example, we don't capture the Cmax within the 12 hours, maybe we need to run the study uh, for 24 hours or it may be 36 hours. Um, and this is an example of a case study that we did with lidocaine and preloquine product. And Dr. Sinner also showed this results where um, by changing the application duration of the product uh, from two hours to four hours, we were able to move the Tmax. And, um, and this, um, in this example, we can clearly see the terminal phase of the drug product within the 10 hours. Uh, so here, the 10 hours or 12 hours sampling duration uh, would be uh, adequate uh, for capturing the PK profile. For, for another drug product, we may not have this early Tmax, so we may need to continue sampling for maybe 24 hours uh, or um, include some other um, or modulate our study design. Um, and another consideration um, that we have talked about is the lateral diffusion and systemic redistribution. Uh, so Dr. Kuzma nicely explained the concepts of uh, both of these, and uh, I, I don't get into those, but I want to mention that in many of our studies, we had controlled probes to evaluate um, lateral diffusion and systemic redistribution. And in one of um, the studies, particularly, um, with the lidocaine perlocaine product, we applied a high dose, uh, 150 milligram per centimeter square of these products um, to make sure we are able to uh, um, we are able to get quantitative uh, quantitative and detectable level um, of uh, lidocaine perlocaine in lateral diffusion probes and redistribution probes. So, in this study, at the application sites. Um, the concentration that we detect for perlocaine in green and lidocaine in purple were between um, 5,000 to 25,000 nanogram per ml. But um, the concentration we detected in lateral diffusion probes showed in, uh, shown in dashed line and redistribution probes shown in solid line were um, less than 40 nanogram per ml, which is uh, a few orders of magnitude lower than what we detected at the application sites. Um, and interestingly, that the Tmax uh, was slightly higher than the Tmax that we saw at the um, uh, application site. And we can further discuss at the, uh, the panel um, uh, for session two and session three, whether we always need to have these controls in our BE studies. Um, so Dr. Kuzma talked about some of the limitations associated with using these continuous sampling techniques, especially DMD. And during the um, 10, nearly 10 years of research in this area, we were able to overcome some of these limitations. For example, with use of portable pumps at Uranium Research, uh, we now uh, are able to conduct studies up to 36 hours because then now the subject can move a little bit and can, for example, use the bathroom. So the duration of the study has um, extended to a great um, extent. And um, we have a lot of controls in place. And you heard from Dr. Sinner and Dr. Kuzma, for example, we control the application side, application technique. We measure probe depth, barrier integrity, flow rate, et cetera, to make sure we are controlling and reducing the variability in the data. And uh, by um, having method development and some validation strategies in place, making sure you have qualified equipment, probe and method parameters. And by optimizing the B study design, uh, we can um, have a um, reproducible and accurate method to be used for um, assessing the biochemists and topical products. And as it regards to data analysis, um, we were able to leverage um, the statistical analysis that were developed for um, uh, IVPT. Uh, to use uh, and use those as, um, stats uh, for assessing the um, data from DOFM and DMD. So we were able to demonstrate um, that both of the, these techniques can detect differences in dermal drug concentration, and both may be used for evaluating bioavailability and bioequivalence of hydrophilic and hydrophobic drug molecules. And uh, specifically for lidocaine and perlocaine, we compared these two techniques against each other, and both were capable of assessing bioavailability of a lidocaine and perlocaine. And um, 
in our studies, when we had controls for lateral diffusion and systemic redistribution, the concentrations that we detected in these probes were minimal compared to with drug concentration detected at the application sites. And um, we think a pilot study can be done, conducted to assist with optimizing the design of the BE study, for example, in terms of selecting the dose, sampling duration, application duration, or um, using the pilot study data to estimate the number of subjects that you would need to power the BE study. Um, so while we have uh, got very promising results, we still have some potential challenges to address that we want to specifically talk about during uh, panel in session two and session three. Uh, we need to make sure that industry has access to these techniques and expertise. There are some challenges associated with bioanalytical method validation that we're going to talk about. Um, we need to make sure we have standardized methodologies that are well qualified and we can conduct these um, studies at different CROs. And uh, we need to make sure we have appropriate and uh, data analysis in place and take into consideration uh, the scenarios where we have missing time point or missing probe data, et cetera, and um, the challenges associated with cost and how we can um, decrease the cost of um, conducting these studies. So in conclusions, um, FDA is investigating novel alternative scientifically valid methods, including in vitro and vivo approaches to support the assessment of BE for topical drug products that have compositional differences compared to the reference standard. And continuous PK-based approaches using DOFM and DMD have the potential to support demonstration of BE when these methods are optimized and controlled to be adequately discriminating and reproducible. Uh, the design of the pilot B study using both of them, both of these techniques can be informed by conducting a pilot study supported by in vitro or in silico data. And if you're interested to use these um, thermal sampling techniques and use cutaneous PK-based method as an alternative B approach, you can submit a pre-ANDA product development meeting request to Office of Genetic Drugs. Um, with that, I would like to thank and acknowledge my colleagues and supervisors at US FDA and our research collaborators, especially the PIs of uh, the two, um, uh, the several grants um, at Union Research and Long Island University, Dr. Frank Sinner and Dr. Grazia Stagni. Thank you everyone for your attention. Dana, are you continuing the recording? Yes. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Ramazan Lee. That uh, was a fantastic overview. It certainly demonstrates um, the advanced stage of development um, that uh, we're in for uh, these methodologies. Uh, so I am delighted now to, uh, uh, to help moderate our question and answer session with uh, uh, our distinguished panel, and I would like to introduce a, a few additional uh, panelists as well. Uh, and perhaps all of our uh, speakers and panelists would be able to turn on their cameras as, 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 as we move into this uh, session, this panel discussion now. Uh, allow me to introduce uh, Dr. Hiran Patel. He's a staff fellow in the Office of Bioequivalence within uh, FDA's Office of Generic Drugs. Uh, Dr. Chinmay Shukla, who is a clinical pharmacology team leader within uh, the Office of Clinical Pharmacology in FDA's Office of Translational Sciences. Uh, Dr. Nageshwar Thudi, who is uh, the Vice President of Global Generics and Biosimilar Clinical Development and Operations at Teva Pharmaceuticals. Um, Candice Edwards, who is the Senior Vice President of Regulatory Affairs at Amniel Pharmaceuticals. And Charlie Deliberti, who is the President of Montclair Bioequivalence Services, LLC. Uh, I will say that I've offered very brief uh, titles really just for, uh, uh, for all of our very distinguished uh, panel members, but I would encourage you to go to the complexgenerics.org events page um, for today's workshop. And I would encourage you to take a look at the, uh, the biographical document because these are incredibly distinguished individuals. We're very fortunate to have them with us uh, today. Uh, so I'd like to begin by, um, by taking some of the questions that came through the chat. Uh, thank you so much to the audience for the questions that you submitted. Uh, these were some questions for our speakers, uh, and perhaps we'll take the first few minutes to actually talk through uh, some of the methodological considerations um, that, um, that our speakers 
uh, identified. Uh, and then th this would be particularly questions for uh, Dr. Benjamin Kuzma, Dr. Frank Sinner, and Dr. Thanaz Ramazanli. Uh, one of the questions that came in is that uh, both dermal microdialysis and, and dermal open flow microperfusion, DMD and DOFM, uh, involve the placement of probes in the dermal layers of the skin. And the question was, what would be the effect of the depth of probe placement on data variability? You know, is this studied as part of the developmental studies? Can you speak to that? Um, yeah. Frank, you want to go first? Yeah, go ahead, yeah. yes, yeah. Uh, so yes, it's a, it is a challenge since you are inserting the probes, um, one person or many people, um, there's gonna be variability from person to person. And so and it's really difficult to control how, how deep you put the probe. You can obviously visually see when you put the probe in how deep it is. Um, but we used ultrasound after the experiment was over. So this was really just giving us um, an idea of if there was a very high exposure, if that could be a potential reason um, either to exclude the data or to understand why we have such a high exposure compared to other probes that seemingly were at the same depth. Would you like uh, to add to that, Frank? Yeah, for sure. So um, on a clinical basis, it is perhaps a little bit easier than putting it in the preclinical model, especially if you work with pigs. Um, you need trained personnel to do it reproducibly. And yes, as we have normally a gradient in the dermis, a concentration gradient, it makes a difference at which probe depths you have the probe. And lower variability in probe depths leads to lower variability of your data. And normally what we see in our clinical studies is that we have that around one millimeter probe depths plus minus 0.2 millimeters. So this is nice reproducible. And with this, you get really nice data, which is uh, which you can use afterwards for, for your BE studies, but you need trained personnel. So that was, uh, Frank, you were saying about one millimeter plus or minus 0 0.2 millimeters. So relatively yes, precise sorry. with trained personnel in yeah. human beings. Is that right? Yeah, 0 0.2 millimeters that was. Sorry <laughs> if I did it wrong. Um, no, no, I just wanted to make sure that I'd heard that correctly. Uh, and then another question was relating to the effect of lateral diffusion. This was a question that came for you, Frank. Uh, the effect of lateral diffusion, uh, they were interested in whether that was one of the things that you had evaluated in the human studies uh, that you performed. Uh, I, yes, uh, we did it with all these three molecules, which we did. So cyclovir, diclofenac, and with Emla, so with pyridocaine and lidocaine. And in the later two for Zemla and with Diclofenac, we looked at lateral diffusion and we also looked for redistribution from the systemic. And in all cases, as I said, it was about 0.2 um, to 0.5% in the maximum. And that was a study where we had 60 gram. So we really had a huge amount, which we additionally put to the belly to get systemic exposure. So it is low compared to the concentration which you get from the treated sites. So, you know, so in terms of your opinion then of whether what we're measuring in a probe is you know, for the vast predominant part, what we're actually measuring is permeation from the skin above as opposed to lateral diffusion. Uh, I think you know, that's at the heart of what these questions are. What is your opinion about whether this methodology is actually able to uniquely measure what's actually permeating from the test versus the reference product without being confounded you know, to any significant degree by lateral diffusion. But the lateral diffusion is very, very low as you've seen. So it's, it's, it is lower than the redistribution from systemic. So if you space as also Ben showed in his preclinical data, uh, we have our application sites spaced apart for 50 millimeters. So if you have at least 50 millimeters between your application sites, lateral diffusion is negligible. Thank you so much. Um, another question that came in uh, relating, related to the dose removal procedure um, and how you ensure that the dose removal procedure is done consistently uh, for all subjects. We have one person per thigh, as we do in parallel two thighs per subject. 
and the removal process is written down in the SUP and we use a wet swap and then a dry swap in a defined procedure. So how long it is and from which side um, you take off um, the drug. And so one person is doing the removal procedure on each thigh. And by BE comparison, you compare the application thigh on one thigh. So within one BE comparison, the same person who does a removal procedure to be as comparable as possible. Thank you. So, um, I, you know, I have some questions as well, and, and they, they kind of maybe bigger picture um, questions, because when we think about a clinical site uh, that would potentially conduct a DMD or DOFM bioequivalent study, um, what are some of the things that you think they would need to understand about the equipment and the qualification of the equipment um, that would need to be performed? And you know, I'm wondering if, if you can speak to some of the considerations in terms of selecting the probes, uh, you know, the, the material of the probe, uh, let's say the membrane, if it's a microdialysis probe, uh, the size of the probe, the molecular weight cutoff of the membrane, if it's dermal microdialysis, uh, also, what are some of the uh, in vitro assessments that can be done before you even get to the clinical study so that some of these things can be figured out efficiently? What are some of the considerations relating to the pump um, that may impact the flow rate or the consistency or even things like study duration? Can you speak a little bit to what would be the equipment qualification considerations of actually implementing this in a, in a clinical setting um, you know, for a bioequivalent study? And Frank, uh, maybe Ben, would you like to begin? And then Frank, you can uh, you can pick up from there. Sure, I can. Uh, so I'll start with the the in vitro kind of characterization of the probe. So when we had first started this study, there were several commercial commercially available probes, um, but they were only for preclinical use. They were not for clinical use. Now there is a company that does have one that is for clinical use. Um, but when we were doing the in vitro assay uh, to basically see how much the drug, how much of the drug could be recovered with the microdialysis probe, we had tested several different uh, membranes. But the the trouble is, is that the polymers or the, the membranes themselves aren't really made for microdialysis; they're made for kidney dialysis. And so it was a very difficult time, um, kind of searching for a hollow dialysis fiber um, that had optimal characteristics of the polymer and the molecular weight cutoff. So I believe we only found a few, um, but in doing so, we kind of figured out how the microdialysis um, membrane ultimately impacted the recovery. And so when you evaluate the in vitro recovery, you really want to make sure that you can have a higher uh, recovery, whether that's either slowing down the flow rate. And so with the advances in LCMS, you only really need about a microliter, two microliters to inject in the sample. Previously with HPLC, you maybe have needed 30 microliters. So that really um, kind of reduced the temporal resolution that you had. Um, but you can do certain things in the in vitro setting to optimize how much drug you can or how much um, or percentage recovery that you can potentially have to recover um, a good amount of drug um, so that you can make a fair comparison between um, two different drug products that you're comparing. Um, but as far as the pump uh, was concerned, we we had used a standard pump that was um, basically delivering the flow rate at a constant rate the entire time. And we would visually check to make sure that there was enough um, volume within the HPLC vial, which is approximately 30 or was 30 microliters. And we had a, um, that we could visually check against to make sure that we were, um, getting the amount that we, we thought we were. Um, so that's from the in vitro side of things, but I think Frank can probably speak more to the clinical side of things. That would be great. Uh, Frank, if you could do that, because I want to make sure we have enough time for the other uh, uh, panelists as well with a lot of questions. Go ahead, Frank. Go. For sure. Um, I will only speak for DOFM. So um, as we have no membrane or the membrane related aspects does not apply to us. Um, I think what you have to be aware of is that you have multiple probes in a subject and, and especially the inversion of the probe um, takes some time. So you need more personnel at the beginning of these kind of experiments. Um, you have to handle microfluidics. So you have really have to have a dedicated team being able to do so. And everything has to be standardized, every single thing, just to make sure that you really get reliable data. 
And one aspect, which is also different, which we see with other zeros, normally you're used to blood. This is a time point. And here you have a time period. So you sample a probe over one hour, which represents the entire hour. So data management and data and statistic is different because you don't treat the time point. You have a time interval. It's a great point. Thank you, Frank. Uh, Tanaz, is there anything you'd like to add to that before I, I move on to some of the industry considerations? Um, no. Okay, Thank very you. good. So I, I would like to, uh, you know, we have uh, uh, Charlie Deliberti and Candice Edwards and uh, Nagesh Tudi uh, with us today. This is really valuable because they're able to offer an industry perspective. And I am curious, you know, for generic companies who are developing top products, can you help us understand your thoughts or potential concerns about uh, performing these cutaneous PKB studies, and either whether it's related to cost or you know, access to a clinical research group or a, a site that has a suitable experience with conducting these? You know, what are the things, what are some of the things that are a little bit um, um, the unknowns that are people gonna have to deal with here? So I'd like to start a, a, a couple of things. You know, first of all, I think the science is amazing and um, it's great to see the evolution of, you know, where we've come. I've been in the industry a long time, always working with topical products. So it's really great to see the evolution of the science into um, these new technologies. Um, and one thing, you start to think about logistics from a company perspective and, and a clinical site management. And so you've got these, um, probes and things that are in the subjects and you're keeping subjects, you know, sort of in place uh, to some extent for long periods of time. So one of the things that's been uh, running through my mind, how do you manage the control of the subject um, themselves to make sure that certain uh, functions that they have to do, they need to eat, they need to, you know, use the restroom, they need to get up. How do you um, assure that those factors don't impact the outcome of the study? That was one thought. The second thought is um, we see a lot of, um, I've seen a lot of data demonstrating the discriminating capabilities of the methodologies in terms of large differences in drug concentrations. But as you know, in our real world, um, we're dealing with very minor differences in formulations when we're trying to establish bioequivalence. And so is there, are there any plans to start to look at more uh, this more discrimination in terms of, you know, very small differences in formulations that are either within or outside of the constraints of, of standard bioequivalence. Those are two thoughts that have gone through my mind. Thank you. Those, those are great questions. And I, I wonder if it's okay, uh, you know, before maybe we hear from uh, Nagesh and Charlie, um, I wonder if, if some of our panelists uh, who were involved in these studies could actually address uh, the questions that um, uh, that Candice just uh, posed. Uh, maybe Tanaz, would you be able to comment a little bit yeah. on the, the, you know, not just the, the products that have big differences, but products that were you know, not necessarily Q1, Q2 the same, but they were approved generics and some of the ways that we incorporated those study pro products into these studies? Sure. Um, so what I would like to note that um, we, we, but in the studies that we have done, we are sure that we are detecting what is in the skin and, and there's um, variability associated with uh, skin permeation. That is the nature of the, of the skin. Um, so while we selected um, large, sometimes large differences in the dose amount to um, kind of um, create situations where we have distinct bioavailability, it doesn't mean that the method um, is not sensitive enough to discriminate by abilities. And, um, and um, uh, the examples that Dr. Uh, Rani mentioned, uh, for, for example, for acyclovir products, we had uh, multiple formulations um, that had differences in um, components or compositions and, and we used them and we got some distinct um, profile and we looked at different dose amounts uh, of them. Uh, but um, while we did that to show the method is sensitive, it doesn't need to be established that um, these are sent because these are not in vitro methods. It, we believe that well, they, we have a um, controlled um, and qualified equipment in place and the study parameters 
they are measuring what is in the skin. And, um, and if the differences is significant enough, that is, uh, uh, and that is the significant enough, the, the techniques would, would be able to measure that. Uh, you just need to make sure you have controlled study design and um, you have um, optimized the study parameters for that. Um, so I, I wanted to make sure that the examples we show for um, different dose amounts and the, the differences, like the, you need to sometimes uh, increase five times in the dose amount to create differences in the viability. It's not that the method is not discriminating enough. Um, it's, it's that we needed to create scenarios where we have this thing by availability and that's why those were chosen. Um, I think that's a really good point that, that uh, uh, Dr. Mar Ramazamli raises that, you know, while we did this because this is a new methodology, you know, we don't look at the discrimination sensitivity of a plasma PK study, you're measuring what's there. And that's essentially what uh, this methodology is doing, and it, you know, it's measuring what's there. But I, I wonder, uh, Frank, uh, or at least that's our, our, you know, our, our perspective on things based upon the research we've done, and a fair amount of familiarity with these products, uh, with these projects, uh, sorry, with these methodologies. Um, Frank, I wonder if you could speak to the first uh, aspect of the, um, just the, you know, the everyday normal human logistics of, mm -hmm. uh, of being, uh, you know, connected to all those probes and pumps. Yeah. So... Uh... This is handled as a normal study at our site. So subjects come in the morning normally. Then you have all the normal procedures. People are sitting normally in bed. Um, everything is done on their thigh. It takes about three, four hours to have all the probes placed, connected, and have the pre-run period, and then the sampling starts. And then people can go to the toilet if they need, or they are free to move their arms, they look to television, they eat regular meals. So it's like a normal clinical study. The only thing is that they, we try to prevent moving because if you have quite a couple of probes in the, in the thigh, so it's not very good to move around. It could ca cause artifacts. So if they have to go to the toilet, they go to the toilet. And if not, they are sitting in bed and are working and are looking to TV. So just a normal clinical study in our view. And I think what I heard in part of that question is there, during those periods when individual subjects you know, do use um, the facilities, um, do you see issues with the data because they moved during that time period? No. Uh, at the beginning, um, there were a couple of artifacts when going to the toilet. Um, this was due to having a lot of probes, but now we are used to it. We haven't seen it anymore. So, no, you, you have to know how to deal with it, but once it's standardized, it works. Very good. Thank you so much. Uh, I'd love to also hear from, uh, from maybe Dagesh and, and Charlie uh, on the same types of uh, you know, uh, considerations or questions that you have um, you know, about um, being able to adopt these types of studies uh, in kind of real world product development situation. Charlie, you want to go or you want me to go first? Nagesh, you go first. You, you go first, okay. Nagesh. <laughs> okay, excellent presentations and amazing work. Definitely, there is no doubt. Uh, so before I also have one question, mainly like, uh, of course, everybody spoke about type problems, complexities, but what were the like, like if injections, right? We call injection site reactions or in case of sometimes we call application site reactions. I would like to hear more on that as well, but coming to other things, it's a definitely, if someone figure it out, definitely, I, I wrote it to use the right word, I, I'll read it. If someone figure it out how to do right this, labor intense and time consuming studies potentially definitely there is a lot of savings for the industry uh, it uh, money wise but the thing is somebody need to figure it out uh, without uh, any delay in launching or approval of the product uh, we i know it's a 10 years work but is there anything like white paper is fda or like uh, other like people who worked on this planning to do it like a white paper for do's and don'ts, like question and answers. Is there any such plan? Um, so we, we have publications in the scientific literature uh, related to this, uh, and we're still continuing to um, 
uh, to study certain aspects, uh, particularly relating to kind of pharmacokinetic principles. Um, you know, I think it's a, it's a very good point you 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 bring up that it sounds like it would be very helpful if we were able to put together um, a document and uh, you know perhaps what we can do for this workshop. What one of the things we we're planning to do is actually have a workshop report that discusses some of the things that have been. Um, you know, uh, talked about through this workshop. But I, I think that's a very good idea, Nagesh, to be able to increasingly put information out there that serves as sort of question and answer and helps people to become more familiar with this. Uh, I think there were some other aspects of your question that perhaps the speakers uh, might also like to address. Um, can I add something to what you said, Sam? Uh, we would like to work with you if you're interested in using these methodologies for as an alternative by Kibun's approach. And uh, I introduced pre a and product development meeting pathway. So even if you have some preliminary thinking or data or proposal, we would be uh, more than happy to work with you and uh, provide recommendation as part of the pre a and review. Yes, go ahead, Frank. And, and perhaps for the first question. So um, we at UNM Research with the Medical University of Graz, we have performed these FDA research studies, but we have also performed a lot of other studies. We use these D of M probes also in patients. So you can use it in uh, affected skin, like psoriatic skin, atomic, atomic dermatitis, et cetera. So up to now, we have used 4,000 D of M probes clinically and we had no adverse event. So we had over 350 subjects and over 100,000 sampling hours with DUFM. So I think we have a big body of evidence that it works. Um, as I said before, we do quite a lot of NCE studies as well. And um, so this is, yeah, just for us to answer the first, study, first question. I'll also add a, a little bit about the first question. Um, so there is some irritation when you insert the probe. Um, I think that's maybe to be expected, but maybe about 15 or so minutes after the, the irritation subsides and it, it appears as this, the skin is, is back to um, as it was beforehand when you put the probe into the skin. So there is some local irritation, but that can be reduced with um, ice packs and things like that. Great, thank you. Yeah, yeah. and perhaps to add here, but Ben is right. If you look at PK, after half an hour, everything should be okay. If you look at cytokines, there could be even reaction which are coming up hours after insertion. So you just have to distinguish between PK and PD. Good point. Uh, Charlie, uh, would you like to jump in? Because I want to make sure we have a few minutes for some of sure. our other panelists as well. Thank you. And I, again, I think this is wonderful technology, um, a welcome um, change in direction from the traditional clinical endpoint bioequivalent studies. Um, some operational concerns or, or uh, questions that I have would be the, the reality is that the vast majority of bioequivalent studies these days are performed in India. And it's a different population, different cultural norms, et cetera. And uh, my question is, has any effort been done to um, address potential differences of uh, performing this sort of technology in India? Because quite frankly, I think acceptance is going to be sort of limited until we can do low-cost studies of this kind in India. For example, um, you know, if you have low body mass individuals with very thin uh, skin, is that an issue? Um, acceptability to the local population, you know, some of these um, uh, subjects sign their informed consent forms with a thumbprint. So I can just sort of envision when they see all these tubes sticking out of your leg, is, is that going to be culturally acceptable? And in women also, uh, that, that could be an issue. Um, is there scarring or discoloration when you have dark skin? I don't know, but you know, these are, is it acceptable to the DCGI? Uh, ha has that been explored? So, you know, the whole issue of being able to do these studies in some place other than say North America or Europe or, you know, a place like that, I think should be explored. Those are great questions. Yeah. Excellent points. Um, and great recommendations too. I, I don't know if uh, if any of our uh, speakers wanted to comment on some of the questions that Charlie brought up. 
Well, but from, from our side, uh, it's, it's, it's a great question. We haven't done it in India yet, so I can't answer it, but we would be open to it. And um, scaring in darker skin is known from suction blister. We don't believe that it would happen with microdialysis or DOFM, but we don't have the data, so we would have to, to look into it. Thank you. So I also wanted to make sure that we could, uh, you know, we have the, the benefit of having uh, Dr. Hiran Patel and Dr. Chinmay Shukla uh, with us also from uh, from FDA. And I was interested a little bit on a regulatory perspective to kind of close out our session, that there are certain things that need to be figured out before conducting a pivotal study. And you need to be able to validate your sample matrix, uh, which in this case is a mixture of the profusate and the dermal interstitial fluid. So it's basically diluted dermal interstitial fluid. Uh, you need to be able to estimate uh, sample size, uh, you know, population size for your study. Um, you need to be able to ensure that the product dose is not so high that you're unable to detect the difference. For example, if your test product had higher drug delivery than your reference product. So from a, kind of an FDA review perspective, What's some of the information that you imagine FDA would be interested in seeing that would demonstrate the suitability of the pivotal study conditions? Uh, and I guess related to this, what, what do you envision, uh, would you envision that a pilot study would be necessary, would likely, what would it entail? Um, you know, uh, perhaps uh, Chinmay, would you like to go first and then uh, Hiran can comment on this? Uh, sure. Uh, so from a regulatory standpoint, at least in my opinion, a pilot study might help. Um, it's going to help with uh, first understanding the innate variability uh, that you might observe with these uh, with these methodologies. Also, before you like jump into the humans, it's very important that you do all the probe characterization studies in vitro. Uh, it's be best to begin with like in vitro microdialysis uh, probe delivery and retrodialysis studies to see how the probe performs before you jump into humans. So in my opinion, maybe a pilot study would help uh, before you jump into a larger pivot study and looking into the variability of the expected uh, PK parameters that might help you with the sample size collection and also help you inform uh, the timing and the duration of sample size collection. That's a good point. Um... Hiran, would you, would you like to add to that and maybe also comment on, um, you know, what do you think would be some of the critical controls that would need to exist in a, in a pivotal study um, to make sure that it's a, a well-controlled study? Thank you, Dr. Rane. So I think, first of all, I would like to thank all speakers to present the incredible work, you know, that they have been spent in decades of. I, feel, I see the, the, the progress and this is incredible. Uh, I, I just want to echo what you know, Dr. Spula mentioned that I think the, I also like in my opinion, pilot study is something, you know, it helps, you know, identify the dose amount, uh, whether you need the, the additional probe for the pivotal study, like for the lateral diffusion or for the redistribution. So uh, pilot study is something which is critical uh, before going into the pivotal study. So I know we are running time, so probably we'll explore more in, in session three. Okay, very good. Yes, I, I do apologize that we didn't have more time. I know we didn't get all uh, to all the questions that were submitted also, uh, but I do wanna make sure that uh, people are able to have a, a short break and we will be continuing this discussion in session three. So the design of this uh, workshop was that the presentations were in session two uh, and we have some panel discussion here, but we're gonna have the entire session three dedicated to discussion, uh, including some of the individuals who are, are, are from this panel. So uh, look forward to that ongoing uh, discussion. Everyone gets a few minutes break and we'll see you back in about uh, five to seven minutes at, uh, at 3.30. Thank you so much, everyone.